Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. I feel like I, I feel like we live a very similar life because I, I have been bullied as an adult, but I did get bullied as a child. Um, I was scared to go to school every day. I don't, I've, I feel like I've chosen to forget it and move on and I've dealt with it really well. And I think we, we were later connected through the game of basketball later on anyway. Uh, and it, so it was fine, but I feel like I was micromanaged constantly as well in all of my careers. I didn't become a teacher until I was 28. But I think that leadership style is when leaders, the older leaders are doing it today, they're adapting that the way they were led mm. growing up, because I think it was a very 70s, 80s and 90s business model leadership style, wasn't it? Mm. In, in, in micromanaging each individual. And then, but then I reflect on the actual leader themselves. They're not leading their own way. They're not getting up in a healthy way. They're not eating well and they come to they come to work mm. with that unhealthy mindset so that because of the, because they can't inspire on a large scale they manage individually because that's the that's the easiest way to do it i mean does that make sense what i'm trying to say there yeah i mean i, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and i know i know we've both had horrible experiences with mm. um, bosses um i like to give people the benefit of the doubt if i can me too yeah i feel like a lot of the time People are really good technically at their job. And so they get promoted into a management position, which is a completely different skill set. Mm. But they might not get any training in that. And, you know, they've been rewarded for being really good technically. And so I think it is it, it feels obvious to some people that then they need to instill in others, this is technically how you do it. And this, I, I feel like... Yeah. There's a lot of pressure put on managers to lead. <laughs> and if you don't yeah. know what leading and inspiring is, then then you go to the next easiest thing, which is telling everybody exactly how you want it done. Yeah, that's right. You know, Simon Sinek refers to it as, and I actually had this conversation with the teacher today. It's like being a parent. We all have the capacity to be a parent and a leader. Does it mean we all should be a parent and a leader? Uh, and, and, you know, I won't go down that track as a teacher, but you know what I mean by that. And um, sh do we all want to be a parent and a leader? Not everybody wants to be a parent. Not everybody wants to be a leader, but mm -hmm. they in a way sometimes get promoted or forced to go into that position um, because of the, they're awesome at their job, technically mm -hmm. speaking, or they're very good or experienced length of service. Mm -hmm. They get that position, yeah. but then they left to just fend for themselves and there's no real development in teaching them how to lead. Mm. Right. And yeah. showing them the skill sets. Um, but those bosses don't have that skill set. So how can they train them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it, it is just a, a downward spiral, isn't it? Because if all you've experienced is micromanagement, what are you going to do when you become a leader? Yeah. And, and, and every time I've been on a leadership course, we have all these leadership theories mm -hmm. and I'm going, I've always said it, but I couldn't say it out loud. And as I've gone further into my track of understanding what I've learned and gone on and writing the book, these theories don't cater for each individual personality, character, their own environmental factors, their own traumas, their own issues that they've got going on in their own lives. Yet, let's just, let's, let's take the human side of leadership. And if we're going to categorize it, let's look at compassion, empathy, and perspective. Yes, the three of the major traits that you need to be yeah. able to develop and then take into the leadership role. Yeah, I totally if, agree. I totally if agree. If you have those things, you can learn slowly how to be an inspiring leader. You just need to be a human. You need yeah. to ask lots of questions, understand the other person, yeah. and just be human. Just have some empathy. Yeah. You're right. You know, I feel <laughs> having gone through having my own leadership development business, I've seen all the leadership models as well. And, you know, you look at them and they're all okay. They're all fine. They all yeah. make sense. Yeah. Um, and my big thing when I was when I was doing this was very much, it's, it's not the leadership model looking at it and thinking, yes, okay, that makes sense. I can do that. I can be that. We can all be that mm. when the going is easy, when everything's going well. 
things fall apart when things get difficult, when we're under pressure, when there's a crisis. That's, yeah. that's when these behaviours disappear. And what happens in our brain <laughs> at that point is we revert to habits or um, ways of being that have been instilled in us in those similar situations. So if somebody has managed a crisis around us in a certain way, or if it may even go back to how parents have, have behaved with you in a crisis, that is what our brain goes to. Our brain is, is kind of scanning the environment and thinking, oh, this is a crisis. This is how you behave in a crisis. Mm. And that's what needs rewriting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, no, fascinating. And get that on a leadership programme. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It really is. Yeah, you're spot on. Well, we're covering. We are covering a lot of the, different brand. <laughs> the brain, leadership, and yeah. uh, your journey, and parts of my journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. Okay, so uh, the bu the bullying then for you is a pivotal part in your yeah. character change. Your, uh, your what do we call what did we call it before the episode? The psychometric is that what it was connected yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my my psychometrics, my. Uh... My personality type changed. Uh, I've never heard of that before. That that makes life. Psychometrics. Yeah, psychometric. Yeah, I've never really looked at that. I need um, to read into that. You you might know of it without realising. So if you've come across uh, Myers Briggs, MBTI, or any of those kind of personality typing um, questionnaires that people do, that that is psychometrics. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we, we spoke about your childhood and uh, being at school. What was your childhood like outside of school, the home environment? Well, you know, I would, if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said it's a perfectly normal childhood. Nothing remarkable. Yeah, because yeah, you realised later in life, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. What did um, you realise later in life? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how I realised it. I was watching the telly with my husband. And um, I can't even remember what the programme was, but on the programme, there was a guy cuddling his two kids on the settee. And I just rolled my eyes and I said to my husband, I wish I wouldn't show stuff like this on the telly. This is not normal. This is not how people behave. And he just looked at me. I mean, his jaw dropped open. He looked at me and said, what do you mean? And I said, well, your dad didn't cuddle you on the settee, surely? And he said, yes, he did. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And I had to kind of rethink my childhood a bit. Um, I don't actually remember ever being touched as a child. I don't. I don't remember having a hug ever. Yeah. Well. Um. And I don't remember. I don't actually remember much in the way of praise. I certainly don't remember mum and dad ever saying they were proud of me. I did overhear them actually when um, when I was uh, doing some training. Um, I won't go into all of that, but um, when I was doing some training, probably in my early 20s, I overheard them boasting to my auntie on the phone about how well I was doing. And and that I mean, I remember that because that stood out so much. It was like a shocking moment. Oh, well, they must be proud of me. Yeah. So um, it's funny, isn't it? We normalise whatever we go through. And I genuinely would have said I had a perfectly normal childhood. Yeah. Um. But that's got to have affected me <laughs> in certain ways. Did you, did they ever, um, what about like the category of sorry, apologising, did they ever say sorry to you? Oh, no, um, that wouldn't happen because, um, you know, they're, they're the parent, they're in control, yeah. they're in charge, they know mm. best, they know, mm. you know. No, that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Finding that later in life then, you travel back to your younger self, now you've got that mindset, that maturity, that perspective. Do you think it did affect you in any sort of way, whether it was missed opportunity, prevention of going down that road opposed to the road you went down? Um, I've done a lot of work on myself, um, even before I realised this. So I've done, a, a, you know, with all the um, psychology that I needed to learn for leadership development and you know, doing my own psychometrics many years ago and not really liking some of the things I saw and working on that and, and changing my way of being. Um, I feel like I have probably dealt with most of it without even being aware of where it came from. Um, but now I actually think it's affected me physically. So 
I do have certain aches and pains and niggles and things that have happened to me physically um, that I'm working with somebody right now who has identified some things that 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 are basically where I'm holding some trauma in my body and it's making me tight, making muscles tight, making the fascia tight in certain areas. Um, so I'm, I'm working through that right now. Um, so that's fascinating work. Um, yeah. that, that really sparked a lot of interest in me. And it was really funny, actually. She's a, she's a specialist in all manner. She looks at the whole body. Um, so she doesn't, she's not a physiotherapist or anything. Who just looks at, oh, you've got a sore shoulder. Let's do this exercise on your shoulder. She looks sure. at the whole body and how mm. your whole, um, posture is and your gait and everything. Um, and she's done some work on reflexes. Uh, and I don't mean like tapping your knee and you, you, you kick your leg. I mean reflexes. How your body is wired from from developmental, right from a baby all the way up. And it was really interesting. Um, she asked me. Uh, she asked me to go and find out. Did I crawl when I was a baby? And I just said, Well, what a weird thing to ask. Of crawl when I was a baby. All oh, babies crawl. And she said, No, some don't. And she said, um, Looking at some of the issues in your body and where they're coming out. Um, she suspected I hadn't crawled as a baby. And uh, next time I saw my mum and dad, I asked them, and indeed I didn't. I didn't crawl as a baby. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, I mean, it's just phenomenal that she can look at me and say she thinks that's one of the issues. So we're currently working on rewiring the bits that didn't get wired because I couldn't didn't crawl as a baby. <laughs> yeah. How, how something so long ago or something that you, again, not – you think that's present in your mind actually is affecting you down the track. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Uh, yeah. the things that, that affect you. I mean, I've not been through any massive capital T traumas, but I do wonder whether some of this, uh, tightness in my fascia, some of these aches and pains and niggles that I have, you know, are just from the, the little T trauma, the, the not receiving the love. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Maybe that's all these issues I think kind of they paint a picture of to why you struggled as opposed to being micromanaged in the 90s maybe yeah yeah I don't know yeah. I mean, if you think about how my parents <laughs> that authority kind that's of I mean. parenting yeah. view I mean this is why I've, I've kind of fought back against authority and micromanagement forever and why I needed needed to work for myself to get away from that um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an obvious link, isn't it? So you, you're a person that loves to work with people, mm. uh, or should I say help people, but mm. do you think work, because I'm a people's person, I love being around people. I think mm. I struggle in teens because of what I try and give out. It's not that I necessarily need it back. I just, I suppose I don't like negative comments on negative vibes and negative energy and i can feel that mm. because i think when people are so positive what i found is a lot of people get turned away from that mm. i don't know i could be wrong it's just maybe it's my experience mm. i don't know where i'm going with that slightly but that's just how i've i suppose i've always felt i've always probably tried too hard and people get mm. turned off by that so that really um, resonates with me because because I didn't get any praise or anything growing up. I do notice, I mean, I'm much better with it now, but I used to definitely, if somebody did praise me for something or appreciate something that I'd done or said or say anything positive to me, my brain immediately went to, what are they up to? Why are they saying that? Yeah. I couldn't just take it at face value that they were just being nice. <laughs> Yeah. Um. I so it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm much better on that front now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I, I. I see where you're coming from. You know. Um. When I entered the coaching world, um, with executive coaching and, and stuff, you know, it was challenging for me because a lot of the coaches I met were very supportive, and that is not the work environment that I'd you used to grown up in. <laughs> not grown up in, but you know, that's not yeah. what I experienced in the work environment. It was very competitive. It makes sense why you're going down the brain route, though, because you're bringing in, uh, I suppose, the neuroscience-based leadership concepts into 
into it, right? And that's why I did a series on nurturing leadership. Is I did a, neuro, a neuroscience-based leadership concept series, and I was fascinated by it. And I think I just did that. I stopped it now. I probably will pick up in the future. I'm really focusing on leading our own way, but I think I did that because I want leaders to think about themselves first. Yeah. And I don't mean in the sense of that egotistical way that we think leaders are doing, but think about themselves at a, a cellular level, uh, think about them at a health level um, to go and actually then build connection and relationships with people. Because how can you connect with people and, and, and support people if you're not connected with yourself first? Yeah. Does you that know, make sense? Bizarre how in tune we are. <laughs> oh, right. um, because when, uh, when I was working in leadership development, um, I did a lot of work around the neuroscience of leadership, also the neuroscience of learning. So how do we, how do I actually make the learning experiences sticky um, yeah. so that they're embedded? Um, but yeah, all about the neuroscience of leadership and what's going on in the brain. Um, mm. And I always like to do a little teaching bit around what is going on in the brain because yes, so I think it's really important that we understand that our brain does things for certain reasons and it might think that it's keeping us safe. But these habits and routines the brain goes through might not be that helpful anymore. They might have been helpful back in the day when we first developed that that approach, but they might, they might not be helpful anymore. Um, mm. And I think it's really important that, that people understand why their brain is doing what it's doing and that it's perfectly normal and natural. And now you know about it, we can rewire around it and find a new way of being in those situations. Well, we now know, don't we, through, you know, neuroplasticity, that we can rewire the brains. We're not set with the brains at, you know, 25, 27 for men, 24, 25 for women, or whatever the exact ages are that we fully form our brain. We we can rewire it. The, the, a guest um, previously, I don't know if I'm going to publish him after you or before him, you yet, but I've been, I've done a filming where um, I've interviewed a uh, Karim Boktor and he has the Karim Boktor method. He's here in Australia. I met him at the Diary of the CEO, actually, and mm. fascinating guy because uh, Stephen Bartlett came out here and um, I've interviewed him. We did a two part. He goes around and he uh, hypnotizes people, NLP training. He does timeline therapy and um, he hypnotized me and I'm going to publish that. Or I have published that. And, um, after the episode, we talk about uh, he he he'll, he focuses on one thing, whether it's fear, anger, stuff like that. Mm. And he asked me at the end how I felt and what I did it, and it's it's on the recording. I was absolutely blank; I couldn't actually retell. And he said, "Well, what's happened there? I've rewired your brain, mm. and I feel like I've worked on rewiring my brain anyway with everything that I've been reading and learning and and and." and and attempting in my life to change, to be clearer and more present and so on. Um, but he, he did, I, 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 if I was to pinpoint out the points, I could, but I couldn't go into depth with it. I mm. actually couldn't recall, I was blank and he was, I'm in shock. You'll be able to see it for yourself. I'm going to publish it or I have published, like I say, oh my Lord, even now if I try to pinpoint out, blank, absolutely wow. blank. And, uh, and so I feel like that fear or that, uh, whatever emotion we were working on, he has cleared from my conscious. Amazing. It's, it's, amazing. it's bizarre. And I've never done anything like that before. And I was, I had my eyes closed for an hour and 10 minutes and it felt like 25 minutes. Wow. Insane. Yeah. Anyway, this just, where are we uh, going with that? Our brains are really plastic and they can um, rewire. Mm. And we've all, all heard stories of people, perhaps who've had a stroke and certain parts of their brain are actually dead after the stroke, but they still regain function because our brain rewires around that. Right. And, and that's a really hopeful story. No matter um, what you're experiencing with your brain, brain fog in menopause, brain fog post um, an infection like post COVID, or whether you think it's just some aging mm. um, or whether you are worried that it could be the start of dementia, it is totally rewirable. We can work around this. We can give yeah. your brain the fuel it needs through fats and ketones because our, brain, our brains, um, as we age, everybody, as our brains age, uh, become less able to use glucose as a fuel source. Right. But they never lose the ability to use ketones. So we can fuel your brain up and do activities, do lots of things to get your body in peak condition and get rid of any inflammation, but also do activities, learning activities, brain training, whatever it may be. Rewire your brain. Yeah. Well, so on that note, then, and, and to connect to the point that you made earlier, um, 
as, as much as I think we should be teaching the kids about the brain and do it in a fun way where they're actually a, attracted to it. And, and I've done it and, and they sit there in silence and they go, well, wait, is it billion neural love pathways? It. Everybody loves learning about the brain. It's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I think we should be teaching leaders this though. Teach mm. leaders, bosses, whoever it may be, join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.